I'm Nicholas Lowe. I'm a professor in the town planning program at the University of Melbourne. As a planner, I care a lot about what goes on in Melbourne and how to make Melbourne a better place to live in. That is the whole of metropolitan Melbourne. In transport, I believe that governments over quite a long time have been trying to solve the wrong problem and failing. I want to tell you about that now in this presentation. In this presentation, I want to answer three questions. What is Melbourne's real transport problem? What, in principle, is the solution? And what's stopping us doing it? The transport problem is widespread across the whole of metropolitan Melbourne. Only a small part of this problem lies in the daily pulse of traffic flow, the commute, between outer and inner Melbourne. If we look at the journey to work alone, we can see that the largest part of the traffic flow is within the local area or amongst neighbouring areas. This table shows journeys to work from two statistical local areas, that is parts of municipalities in the west and two in the east of Melbourne. The figures are from the Australian Bureau of Statistics data of 2006. So from Hobson's Bay, Altona area, 49% of journeys are local. From Wyndham North, 48% of journeys are local. From Manningham East, 48%. From Casey and Cranbourne, 60% are local. Journeys beyond the local area are widespread across the metropolis, not including central Melbourne. Hobson's Bay, Altona, 30%. Wyndham North 33%, Manningham East 42%, Casey and Cranbourne 38%. So journeys to work in the CBD and inner Melbourne are relatively few. Hobson Bay Altona 21%, Wyndham North 18%, Manningham East 11%, Casey and Cranbourne only 3%. You'll note however that the western suburbs send many more people across the Yarra to inner Melbourne than the eastern suburbs. In fact, the cross Yarra flows from the east are simply negligible. Yet the east-west tunnel is being built from the east first, and the western link is indirect even when it is built. These are journeys to work. And of course, there are many journeys for domestic non-work purposes, as this next slide shows. Almost all of this travel consists of local journeys. Time spent on these journeys for non-work purposes has grown dramatically, as recent work by economist Dr. Duncan Ironmonger shows. Women's travel has grown faster than men's, nearly doubling between 1991 and 2006. So we know that the problem is in the day-to-day -day difficulties people have in getting around Melbourne, both by car and by public transport. There is congestion. Journeys are longer than they need to be. And in the outer growth areas of Melbourne, public transport is technically non-existent. It is so infrequent as to rule it out as an option for mobility. There is a huge imbalance between the accessibility of homes to jobs between inner and outer areas. A second part of the problem is that over 50 years there's been an overwhelming emphasis in transport policy on building motorways mostly to serve the outer inner commute by car, but also with some ring roads, as you can see in this next slide. City Link is often held up as the most successful of motorways, involving two tunnels and private-public partnership. Imagine Melbourne without City Link, is often said by motorway enthusiasts. City Link was promised as the answer to congestion. The consultants, Feech Lister, the same consultants the government is using to predict traffic flows, and times for the east-west tunnel, said that CityLink would speed up traffic flows and reduce the time people had to spend in travel. In thinking about traffic flows, we have to think about what a motorway does to speed traffic, not just on the motorway itself, but across the whole road system of which it's part. A motorway does nothing for congestion unless it speeds traffic across the whole system. Feech Lister, predicted that average travel speeds across the road system would increase by 1.1 kilometres per hour once CityLink was built. That might not seem much, but at least it was an improvement. But what actually happened after CityLink was built 
was that travel speeds across the road system decreased. They were 1.8 kilometers per hour less than the consultants had promised. According to VicRoad's figures, time spent in travel, daily vehicle hours, was greater after CityLink than had been predicted. And accordingly, as we know, several billion dollars were subsequently spent enlarging the on-off ramps and adding lanes to the Monash freeway. Politicians continue to promise that building motorways will relieve congestion. Premier Dennis Napthine is on record as describing the East-West Tunnel as a congestion-busting project. However, he must know perfectly well that motorway building does not relieve congestion, but makes it worse and spreads congestion across the road network. If he doesn't believe us, then he should believe one of the most distinguished supporters of motorway building, Dr. Max Lay. Dr. Maxwell Lay, writing in the newspaper The Age on October the 30th, said this, opponents play the congestion card, arguing that previous projects have not eliminated congestion, forgetting that this was never their intent. Lay, the former director of major projects of VicRoads and former chair of the RACV, is in fact saying that it was never the intent of projects like CityLink to relieve congestion. The congestion causing effects of the East-West Link has now been confirmed by the government's own consultant speech lister in a detailed report leaked to The Age on December the 9th, 2013. But all this diverts attention from the real problem which is not being solved. The problem governments have been trying to solve for 50 years is about car commuter traffic from outer Melbourne to the city. They constantly fail but each episode of congestion leads to a demand to build more expensive motorways. The real transport problem is everywhere else around metropolitan Melbourne. People are expected to travel long distances from where they live, but the transport connections between where they live and where they go for work and for entertainment and for shopping and for jobs, of course, are pathetically inadequate and very expensive. There is no integrated planning for the location of residential areas and work or service locations and transport connections. An integrated transport system is what Melbourne needs and what the government is actually required under the Transport Integration Act of 2010 to provide. This is what integrated public transport should look like. There should be mixed modes, exploiting the different quality and capacity aspects of the various modes. There should be easy and comfortable transfers between modes. A simple network with a clear line structure which is easy to learn and remember. Direct route alignment and fastest possible speed of vehicle operations with reliable timetables. This is the Zurich system, but it could be applied in Melbourne. High frequency services where and when the demand is reasonably high, coordinated pulse timetables where the demand is weaker, efficient pendulum lines running through the city and suburban centres and major public transport interchanges connecting housing and work areas, and supporting soft measures such as fare structures, ticketing systems, information and marketing combined with restrictive policies towards car use. So what's stopping us having an integrated transport system serving the whole of metropolitan Melbourne like that of Zurich or Munich or Hamburg? There is a policy mindset that says people will always want to drive cars to work, cars cause congestion, cars run on roads and therefore we need to build new, better, bigger roads to reduce congestion. That mindset also says people will never switch to public transport Public transport can never serve mobility needs in low density areas and therefore public transport cannot relieve congestion. Now today, every transport expert knows that these beliefs are wrong. Investment in the public transport system will relieve congestion and save travel time. There are also institutional barriers. 
The professional vision of most engineers is to build the most beautiful and functional object they can possibly build. Max Lay is right when he says, Melbourne in the past 50 years has produced some of the world's best motorway designs. Traditionally, road infrastructure has been called investment, while supporting public transport has been a drain on the budget. State institutions have been created that maximise investment in roads. What we now have is a transport system designed for purely political objectives, namely serving the ends of political power, not public need. Why will the eastern section of the motorway be built first? Because the Premier knows that an ALP government will build the western section first. Make no mistake, building this motorway, east and west, will define the government's transport policy for many years to come, and the real problem will remain unsolved. So to conclude, we have an opportunity now to stop this disastrous path that governments have been taking for 50 years and to make them address the real problem of Melbourne's transport crisis. We need real solutions that can be applied in the first term of a new government. And they are primarily public transport solutions using existing infrastructure, address congestion and the public transport service across Melbourne now.